Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, this lecture is a continuation of uh, solving combinatorial problems. Um, it's part of the advanced mathematics course for teenagers, which is presented on unizor.com, and that's exactly where I suggest you to view this lecture because it contains notes uh, as well as the video itself. And the notes basically contain the same problems which, uh, which I'm presenting right now um, with the answer. So you can solve your problem, th these problems yourself, which is very important. Check against the answer. And then there is basically the explanation of how can be derived this particular answer. Um, all right, so um, this is not about the playing cards, not about poker as the previous two lectures were in this uh, in this series so these are just completely random four different problems on combinatorics so let's just start all right so the question is how many different six digit numbers exist if three digits are odd and three digits are even okay um, I suggest we, we do it in two different ways and uh, as I said before if you can approach the problem from two different directions and have the same answer that's a good checking because combinatorical problems is very difficult to, to check all right so I will present it in two different versions so the, the version number one well let's just think about um, we have six digits, right? Now we have three odd, and the odd digits are one, three, five, seven, and nine. Five of them, right? And we have three even digits, which is zero, two, four, six, and eight. So if even and odd digits somehow are positioned already among these six, let's say, odd, even, even, odd, odd, even. Okay, this is the position. Place number two and number three and number six are even and the rest are odd. Okay, so if this distribution among odd and even among positions is already set, then basically we can have one of these uh, uh, five different odd digits from these positions one, two, three, four, sorry not two one, three, five, seven, and nine one, three, five, seven, and nine one, three, five, seven, and nine and zero, two, four, six, and eight zero, two, four, six, and eight and zero, two, four, six, and eight so these are the choices so there are five choices for this, and five choices for this, and five choices for this, etc., etc., right? So basically we have five to one, two, three, to the third degree, four, odd, and five to the third degree, four, uh, even places, which is basically five to the six. Now, that's only if I have already distributed odd and even among six positions, right? Now, how many different distributions of uh, the odd and even three, num uh, three digits among six digits is possible? Well, obviously, number of combinations from six by three, right? So I have to choose three places for, let's say, even, all right? Now, if I choose this, it obviously defines already the other places for odd. So if I multiply these, I will get my answer. True, false. And here is a very important detail. Now, among these different distributions, there are obviously distributions when you have the first digit even. Like this one. Even, odd, odd, even, even, odd. Right? But, on the first place, you cannot have zero. So basically, we have to exclude from whatever the number of combinations we have, 
all the different combinations uh, which have zero in front. Okay. That's easy. It's very similar, actually. Let's just think about it. Zero is in front, so the first position is taken, and we know which digit actually is there. So we have the five other positions. Now, on five other places, we can have two even, because one is already taken, that's number one, and three odd, out of five positions, right? So I have to basically find how many different combinations out of five places if I choose two for the even. Actually, it doesn't matter if I will choose three because number of combinations from five to two is exactly the same as number of combinations from five to three. All right, so if I have chosen any one of these combinations, on any place I can put one of five different uh, even numbers and there are two places, right? So I have five different even numbers I can put on any of these even places. Doesn't really matter. And uh, three other places for odd, each one has five choices. So it's five by time, times five times five. And I have to subtract. From this, I have to subtract this. So all the combinations which have zero in front should be subtracted from this one. And that's the answer. All right. Let's approach this differently. Instead of exclusion, we will use inclusion. You know that in many different cases, the combinatorial problems can be solved in two ways, by counting something directly or by counting something bigger and excluding something which we don't really like. And that's what we did here. But now let's do it directly, including everything which we need. Okay. On the first place, on the first place, we can have anything but zero, right? So we can have from one to nine. Well, let's just separate odd and even. If my first digit is odd, and there are five of them, all right? So I have five choices already. And the first digit is odd. Other uh, five positions uh, can be uh, basically uh, anything and two of them must be um, odd because one is already here in the first place and three must be even, right? So, first of all I have to choose which one are odd and which one are even. So let's say I choose two positions out of five remaining places uh, for remaining two odd numbers and each one has five different choices so it's five square and the remaining three positions the the, the place of these positions is already determined by choosing the odd positions so the remaining are even and they can be anything so we have five different choices for even digits and there are three positions, so I have to multiply 5 by 5 by 5. So that's my total number of different six-digit numbers with three odd and three even with odd in front. Now, how about even in front? Well, you have only four choices, right? I exclude zero, right? So we have directly counting what can be in the first place. Four different choices. So it's four different choices. And then I will do exactly the same. I have two other uh, places for even numbers. One is already taken, right? So out of the remaining five positions, I have to find two for my even numbers. And each even number can be uh, uh, chosen among five. So I have to multiply it by five times five. And the remaining three positions are even, so I have this one. And if I will summarize these guys, I better get exactly the same as this number. So you check it. That's it. Okay. 
Next. Next is almost like algebra, basically. Uh, I'm asking to solve the following uh, proportion for x and y. x and y are natural numbers. Positive and greater than 0, right? So the proportion is c x plus 1 y plus 1 re relates to c x plus 1 to y related to c x plus 1 to y minus 1 as 5 to 5 to 3. Well, basically it's two different equations. One is this one 5 to 5 and another is this one 5 to 3. Now, it doesn't, <laughs> it looks maybe a little scary, but it's not really a scary thing because all you have to do is to convert these uh, symbolic representations of the number of combinations into their algebraic formula, basically. So I will use the formula um, uh, m n equals m factorial divided by n factorial and m minus n factorial. Well, that's the formula which I do remember, by the way. It's one of the few formulas which I remember. I don't have to really derive it. But you obviously are welcome to uh, refer to the lecture about uh, the, the combinations uh, in, in, in unisor.com and uh, you will have it. All right, so that's the formula. And let's just use it. So let's use first, these two are related as 5 to 5. Well, 5 to 5 means it's actually equals to 1, right? So this relates to this equals to 1, so cx plus 1 to y plus 1 equals cx plus 1 to y plus 1 to y. So that's what I have. If this relates to this as 5 to 5, then these two are equal to each other. Well, let's just open it up x plus 1 factorial divided by y plus 1 factorial and x plus 1 minus uh, y plus 1 so it's x minus 1 factorial equals x plus 1 factorial divided by y factorial and x plus y minus 1 no x minus y plus 1 factorial x plus 1 minus 1 x plus 1 minus 1 right. okay now x and y are natural numbers obviously we can safely uh, divide both parts by x plus 1 factorial now let's just think about um, what is m plus 1 factorial this is m factorial times m plus 1, right? Because this is uh, the product of all numbers from 1 to m plus 1. This is product of all numbers from 1 to m, and then multiplied by m plus 1. So this is an obvious identity, right? So I will use it in this case. Look, y factorial and y plus 1 factorial. So instead of y plus 1 factorial, I can put y factorial times y plus 1 and cancel y factorial. Same thing here. This is the same as times x minus 1 factorial, right? And I can cancel x minus 1 factorial. So what's left? Almost nothing. Basically, I can invert both and I will have y plus 1 equals x minus y plus 1. 1 is also cancelling, so x is equal to 2y. That's what I've got from the first proportion. Let me put it here. x equals 2y. All right. Let's do the second proportion and we will have the second equation for x and y. All right, what's the second proportion? Uh, okay, so it's x plus 1 factorial, y factorial, 
and x minus y plus 1 factorial divided by this guy x plus 1 factorial uh, y minus 1 factorial and x minus y plus 2 factorial equals to 5 over 3 right so uh, let's rewrite this instead of this uh, division proportional uh, symbol with one uh, fraction so x plus 1 factorial over y factorial and x minus y plus 1 factorial now this would go to a denominator which is x plus 1 factorial and these go to numerator y minus 1 factorial x minus y plus 2 factorial equals 5 over 3 ok, same thing, cancelling this and this now y minus 1 factorial now y factorial is y times y minus 1 factorial, right? so I can divide replace this and have only y remaining here and y minus 1 factorial was cancelling with this one same thing here this is one greater than this one which means I can get rid of this and get rid of the factorial here and what's left 3 times x minus 3y plus 6 equals 5y right so 3x equals 8y minus 6 is that right? ok let's combine it with this guy 3x equals 8y minus 6 so we have a system of 2 uh, linear equations with two variables and to solve this system solving this system presents basically no problem with it all right so let's multiply the first one by 3 and subtract so what do I have 0 on the left and I subtract from this, I subtract this. So I would have 8y minus 6y, uh, which is 2y minus 6. So y is equal to 3. And from the first, x is equal to 6. So that's the solution. That's it. Next. All right, next is about two basketball teams. Okay, so let's have, you have two basketball teams. One is called green shirts and another is called blue shirts. Now, they are um, playing on some neutral grounds, some town which is not really the, the one which is uh, for the greens, uh, not for the blues. So there are a certain number of fans which are initially, well, neutral let's put it this way we have k fans and are, they are initially neutral however they are not exactly neutral some of them have certain preferences and the preferences are the m fans out of this k will never be green team fans and N fans never be blue shirts uh, fans so they might remain neutral or they might go for blues and these guys might remain neutral or they will go for greens but never for blues 
and this one never for greens, all right? And the remaining k minus m minus n, they are absolutely open to anything. Depending on their mood, they can go to greens, to blues, or stay neutral again. Well, so, at the uh, when the game has ended, well, people have their preferences. They are becoming actually the fans of one or another team, or they just don't become the fans of anybody, right? So, question is, how many distribution of fans is possible in this particular situation? Well, for instance, all of these can go to blues, all of these can go to greens, and all the rest can go to, you know, blues as well, all right? So you have certain number of fans for blues, certain number for greens. Or all of them can stay neutral, for instance. It's available as well because it has it never be the green team's uh, uh, fan, but it can stay neutral. So that's another combination. And there are no fans of any uh, team whatsoever as a result of this game, all right? So the question is how many different distributions are possible? Okay. Let's think about it. How many choices does every person have? Well, the choice can be either he becomes uh, the uh, fan of the green team or the blue team or stays neutral, right? So, for just in theory, there are three different choices for every person. But not exactly for every person because we know that these guys cannot be uh, the fans of the green shirts team, right? So for these guys, there are only two choices. And for these guys also, there are only two choices. But the, for, 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 for the remaining K minus M minus N, there are actually uh, three choices, right? So what do we have right now? We have that each one of these M has two choices. So. What's the distribution? Well, there are two to the m's, right? Different distributions of um, fans among the first team. Two choices for each guy, right? Either stay neutral or to be a fan of the blue team. Now, similarly, we have only two choices for these guys. Either stay neutral or become the fan of the green team, right? So this can be never the green, so it can be blue. This is never blue, so it can be green. So both of these guys can have only, I mean, both representatives actually uh, of these groups can have uh, only two choices. So this guy, so these N guys have this type of different choices, all right, as a group. And finally, the remaining K minus M minus N people, each one of them has three choices, right? So three for the first, three for the second, etc. So we have to actually multiply by three choices dot that many that many times so number of choices for each one of these is two so it's two times two times two number of choices for these guys is also two so i multiplied uh, by two n times and number of choices of these guys is this so if i will multiply all these numbers that would give me the total a uh, number of different distributions of the fans among the teams. Now, obviously, this can be combined into two to the m plus n. So that's the answer. Now, the last problem I have, well, it requires certain spatial vision. Um, let me remind you, in one of the lectures, and I do specify which exactly lecture in the notes for this lecture on unisor.com, um, I, I was solving the problem 
of circles dividing the plane in how many different parts can n circles the uh, maximum to, to divide the plane. Now I'm solving, now I do recommend you actually to um, return to this problem um, in, in unizor.com just to, to review how it's solved. Because this one is analogous, but it's in the three dimensions. So let's consider a sphere. And it's cut by different planes, and all of these planes go through the center. So this is an equatorial plane, right? Now this can be the meridian plane, or any other plane at any angle to anything, right? But they're all going through the center, so um, the uh, intersection of the plane and the sphere is actually the, 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 the great circle, so to speak. It's the circle of the biggest radius, right? Equal to the radius of the sphere. So, one plane divides in two parts, right? Two planes, as I have just uh, drawn, uh, divide in four parts. Well, question is, if you have n planes all going through the center of the sphere, now, obviously, we need some generalization condition. So, like, no three planes go through the same uh, diameter of the sphere. So it's not like, like a book, so to speak. One plane, then the second plane, and then the third plane from the same diameter. So that's not the case. So they're all different, right? Well, and obviously the question is, uh, what's the maximum number of parts the volume of the sphere is divided by n planes? Okay. It's not easy to imagine, right? Um, but it's very important, actually, to, 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 to try. Here is the consideration which might actually help you in this particular case. Let function f of n be this maximum number of volume divisions which we have by n planes. Okay? Um, let's just compare it with this number. So, what I'm talking about is let's just have n minus 1 planes and they divide it into some function of n minus 1. And now, let's, let's add to this the nth plane. How many different pieces of volume actually are formed by cutting the nth plane uh, in the most general way uh, through existing picture of a sphere with n minus 1 plane? I would like to solve this like a recursive dependency. All right, think about it this way. So if I draw some other plane, let's say this one. Generally speaking, it should intersect the, uh, the sphere, and this is the intersection. This is the great circle, right? Now, this great circle, again, in the most general case, should intersect with all other great circles which are formed by intersection of other planes with uh, the sphere. So, let's just look at the surface of, of the sphere. Now, this surface has these great circles which are results of intersection of the planes uh, with this uh, sphere. So every new plane introduces a new great circle, and what I'm saying is that in the most general case, when we are looking for the most general and maximum number of divisions, it should actually intersect each other uh, great circle formed by previous n minus one uh, planes. So one circle is intersecting with the new circle, the nth 
circle is intersecting with n minus one circles which were before it. So far so good, right? Now, two circles are always intersecting in two points, right? So on this side of the sphere and on that side of the sphere. So basically, my new nth circle, nth circle has two times n minus one points of intersection with previously uh, uh, forms uh, circles, right? We have n minus one previously formed circles, great circles. Now each one has two points with my nth circle, so that's number of intersections. Well, if this is number of intersections, this is my nth circle, and it has certain number of intersections. Well, the number of intersections is equal to the number of arcs, right, on the circle. So it has these arcs. But now let's just think about it. What is an arc on this nth circle? Arc is a result of intersection with other uh, circles. And if we are going back to the uh, planes um, uh, picture, every arc actually, together with the two radiuses to the center of the, let's say this is intersection. So this arc, together with these radiuses, it represents actually something which this particular plane cuts. So the number of these arcs actually corresponds to the number of cuts to one of the previous um, pieces of volume which we had. So what I'm saying is that each uh, uh, arc on this great circle actually is a result of, s uh, uh, of dividing one of the previous pieces into two parts, which means the number of arcs corresponds to the number of new parts we are introducing with this nth plane. And that's why I can write this recursive equation. So since nth plane intersects with all previous n minus 1, and if you look at the arcs where the great circles are intersecting, each arc actually represents some kind of a section uh, which we are making. Uh, the cut, if you wish, uh, of one of the previous pieces. So for the previous pieces, we should add the number of cuts, basically, because that's so many different um, uh, new pieces we introduce. Okay, so we have this. It's basically sufficient to get the answer, because we know that f of 1 is equal to 2. One plane cuts in two pieces, our sphere. So from 1 we can go to 2, to 3, etc. But it would be interesting to get the formula. Alright, so let's get the formula. If you have such a recursive equation, the formula can be obtained quite easily. Right? That's the same recursive for instead of n, I put n minus 1. Look at this. Let's just add them together. What do I have? This is on the left, this is on the right. And what's remaining? On the left I have f of n. 
on the right I have 2 plus 2 times 1, 2, 3, 4, n minus 1. Well, we know what this is. This is the arithmetic progression. I don't want actually to go through derivation, but this is a very simple thing. And that's the answer. Actually, considering it's very simple, let me just do it this way. I will derive it for you. This is exactly the same sum as here, right? Just the reverse. Now, add them together. You have two s on the left. And on the right you have 1 and n minus 1, n, 2 and n minus n, n, etc. n minus 1 and 1, n. And how many times? n minus 1 times. That's why it's n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Okay. That was the last problem for today's lecture. Uh, I think it would be very good if you will go to the unisor.com go through these problems again and try to solve them again, check against the answer and make sure you get the right results. That would be the, the, the very good exercise and you will remember the techniques etc. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck. <laughs>